Stay tuned for the second half of the Wake Up Mission Show. Here at the Wake Up Mission Show, we want all of our listeners to be debt-free and financially free. We believe a free market system is best for the restoration of liberty. If you are tired of looking for a job in this hopeless market, or if you are struggling to pay your monthly bills, let us help. We have several income opportunities for you which are tested and proven by our company, The Wake Up Mission LLC. To learn more, go to our website, www.thewakeupmissionshow.com and click on the Financial Solutions tab. Welcome back to the Wake Up Mission Show. Well, today our guest is a former VP candidate for the Constitution Party. Uh, he's also an, a lawyer with many of his own firms and a political activist and a veteran. And he has his own podcast, and we'll talk about that as well. So here he is. Give a warm welcome to our guest today, Mr. Daryl Castle. Hi, Daryl. How are you and your uh, lovely wife doing, uh, your lovely wife, Joan? I am just fine, thank you. I appreciate you having me, and Joan is doing great as well. Right, she's just a wonderful woman. I got to know her a little bit when we were back east for the Constitution Party Conference, and she was just a delight. So I, I also, uh, Daryl, I want to thank you again uh, for supporting the Nightingale 2010 campaign. And uh, I met you prior to the campaign uh, back when you were part of the Chuck Baldwin ticket as the VP. And I understand there's a rumor, Daryl, that you might be a potential POTUS candidate vying for the nomination with the Constitution Party uh, this time around 2016. Any truth to this rumor? Yes, it's, uh, you know, I'm obviously considering it very carefully or I wouldn't be traveling around the country speaking, but I haven't made a formal announcement yet because I'm not ready to comply with the FEC regulations that that would bring on me at this point. But yes, I, I'm certainly considering that very, very carefully. Well, fantastic. Now, back when you ran uh, VP in 2008, that really was a rather historical campaign season because besides you and the, you know, the, the Chuck Ball Castle ticket, Ron Paul was also running with the GOP. So Liberty was really prominent back in 2008. But unfortunately, in the end, statism won with the Obama ticket. So, you know, Daryl, you fast forward here seven years later to the present day, and it is obviously POTUS campaign season again. What is different that you've noticed this time around compared to back in 2008? Well, it's worse, uh, obviously. Statism has a, a fairly good track record now. It's won for about 100 years or so. But uh, I think it is so bad that people are starting to listen and people are starting to, to realize that 165 years of Democrat and Republican rule have taken us to the point that we are. And, and on the Republican side, I think Trump's success indicates that. And on the Democrat side, Bernie Sanders, same thing. People are, are tired of the same politics, the same faces, the same voices, the same conversation read from their teleprompter. So they are very open and attuned to, to something different like never before. You're absolutely right. Both uh, Bern, uh, uh, Sanders and Trump's campaign are certainly creating big noises and people are definitely paying attention. Now, Donald Trump uh, has not committed to just being a GOP candidate. Uh, do you think voters are finally ready to vote with courage instead of out of fear and elect an independent or third party candidate? Well, some are. I mean, uh, who knows what will happen between now and November of 2016. But, you know, Trump is, I think what he's saying with his threats of a independent run is, look, if you cheat me like you did Ron Paul, uh, I can cost you the election, just like Ron Paul cost Bill, uh, George Bush the election. 
Uh, I think he just has that leverage, and uh, he's using it right now. But whether the people are ready for that, time will tell. We'll see. Well, you know, Daryl, one of the frustrations, as you know, for those of us who support voting for the right candidate instead of being beholden to one of the two big controlled parties, which really I believe is one, is their argument that if you vote for a candidate outside the GOP, you will cause the Democrat to win. So please really address this issue. Well, I mean, we've seen now, as I said, 165 years, we've seen it. These two parties trade power back and forth, and each time, uh, no matter which party is elected, uh, our values are trodden underfoot, and they just get worse and worse. And there's always a bad person out there that if you don't vote for for our bad person, the even worse person will be elected. And that's a strong appeal for a lot of people, I suppose. But uh, after a while, people... Uh, hopefully we'll get tired of hearing it and we'll understand that nothing is ever going to change unless they they vote for what they believe in, they vote in their own uh, best interest and so forth. Yeah, and not only that, but what I say to people, Daryl, is, uh, and you meant, you know, we've been being wrong, Paul, you know, ran as a libertarian and the Republican uh, did win. And uh, if this was the case, then Democrats would win every single election which, of course, is not true. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, you say 100 and some years, we better start doing something different because, uh, like Einstein says, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, Daryl, is the definition of insanity. Uh, well, that's true. I mean, I think, uh, I think people this time are more willing than ever to punish the two parties for what they've done. And once again, I think that's uh, the success of Trump and Sanders indicate that. I hope so. Now, Daryl, I'm going to ask you a question. You know, obviously, this isn't a you know, personal attack against you. Uh, I'm just doing it for the listeners that uh, pay attention to our show. Uh, you're an attorney. And I know that there are many people out there that are fed up with attorneys in office. We have one allegedly right now in the Oval Office. And yet others that are in the du jour movement, and we have many like Michael C. School, who is on our show every Thursday, part of that. Uh, state attorneys are practicing de facto law and thus should not be in office. Now, what are your comments uh, well, based uh, on I mean, that? I obviously disagree with it. I mean, I am what I am, and uh, I'm quite proud of it for 35 years now. I've represented the interest of the weak and helpless against those of the rich and powerful, and I'm uh, very proud of that. I certainly make no apologies for it, and on a personal note, it's given me a, a pretty good life. Um, you know, they really should be looking, uh, focusing their anger at the Democrats and Republicans rather than what we do for a living. Yeah, yeah. Now, Daryl, I know the majority... Uh, you know, do appreciate your, your service. And also, I want everybody to know, you're also a Marine. And they, they say, and the reason why I say uh, uh, still a Marine, uh, once a Marine, always a Marine. And certainly, uh, since you were uh, in active service, our military has changed uh, within the last several years. Um, the repeal of don't ask, don't tell, illegal aliens, uh, you know, in service, and now the rise of Christian persecution in the military should Americans be concerned about all these changes? Well, absolutely, they should be concerned. I mean, uh, you know, uh, when I was a Marine officer, it's been more than 40 years now. It seems strange, but that's the case. I mean, our duty, our job was clear, and that was uh, to close with the enemy and destroy him. And uh, any soldier, any Marine wants to know what his duty really is. And for decades now, we've used the military as kind of a social experiment, and it's uh, it's struggling and worn out a little bit from 25 years of warfare and 25 years of these experimentations. So uh, certainly they have every reason to be concerned, but I'll tell you this, uh, military people, their families, uh, and people who love the military would be a lot better off with me 
in the White House than they would any Democrat or Republican, without exception, I can assure you. Now, uh, and I hear you too. And then I just want to know, because I, I, you know, I happen to know you're, you're an acquaintance I know personally, that uh, you're very much a constitutionalist. You know the Constitution backwards, forwards. You know the intent. You understand it. I want to make that clear uh, to our listeners. Now, Daryl, a report was released j just yesterday by the U.S. Air Force Central Command, and it stated the United States led airstrikes against the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria and surged to record levels um, in July. And throughout the month, they had drones, warplanes, deployed 2,828 weapons against ISIS targets, according to the new figures released. Uh, so this is about a 66% increase. Are we headed, Daryl, into a third world war? Well, we might be. I mean, uh, the, the problems that we have with Russia and China scare me a lot more than the problems we have with the Islamic State. I think uh, I do see the Islamic State as a strategic threat to America. I mean, they've declared war on us, and uh, they're coming uh, for us. And so that is a great concern to me, but uh, the way we've uh, handled Russia and the Ukraine and so forth is a foreign policy decision that uh, is, is very wrong in my view. I mean, uh, there can be really no doubt left that the West, uh, and that means primarily the United States and its allies, uh, instigated the coup in Ukraine that provoked all this. So those things are all problems, but uh, possibly, I mean, we've certainly, uh, uh, if you bet on war, you'll be right most of the time. Now, if you were POTUS, uh, how would you handle war? How would you handle uh, situations like this? Well, I mean, uh, as, as the Constitution says, only Congress can declare war. And, I mean, I think uh, a president has to look at a situation and say, is this a strategic threat to the United States or is it not? Uh, there are just so many things that are none of our business. I mean, who, who runs a, uh, Ukraine is none of our business. Who is... Uh, president of Ukraine is none of our business, but we've made it our business for one reason or another. And, uh, you know, we, we should not be going to war cavalierly or on executive order or on intimidation by the Secretary of State or anything like that. Amen. That, to me, that's the right answer, Randy. I know it's the right answer for you as well. Again, proving uh, constant minded and, you know, like Washington said, George Washington, of course, uh, do not entangle with foreign alliances. Now, this is not foreign alliances. This is on our own soil. Currently, uh, Daryl, I'm sure you know, Jade Helm 15 is in process, which is, of course, for those who are just now tuning in, it's the largest military exercise on U.S. soil. And albeit it's been pretty quiet uh, since uh, Jade Helm started. However, it did not start out without suspicion, Daryl, due to the master of human domain logo, several mysterious art closures, and increased envoys. Uh, Jade Helm is allegedly slated to end mid-September. So were the individual, you know, uh, original concerns valid? And should people remain concerned about Jade Helm? Well, the concerns are valid. I mean, nobody knows exactly what it is or why they're doing it. I mean, I suppose people do know, but... Uh, they're certainly not telling the general public. I mean, our progressive friends laugh at us when we point it out, but uh, use of the U.S. military inside the United States is forbidden. So it is a big concern for that uh, uh, standpoint, but it's not just the biggest military exercise ever conducted in America. It's the biggest exercise ever conducted by any nation on Earth ever. So wow. yeah, certainly it's a great uh, uh, concern, and it's something that we should watch. Uh, we wouldn't be doing it if I were president, I can tell you that. Oh, God. Well, back to your military service. Uh, you trained under Oliver North. What was he truly like? Uh, he was, uh, we referred to him as crazy at the time. Because we were young, he uh, he was. Uh, I'm sorry, that uh, was funny. But we would have we would have followed him anywhere. I mean, he was a very inspirational leader. But he was, uh, uh, he was what I would describe as a Marine Corps zealot in that 
he really bought into what he was doing, and he went at it full flesh. I mean, he had to be there to understand what I'm talking about, but he he was a hard man. Uh, he was old school, and uh, he didn't put up with any nonsense, and uh, he didn't mind getting blooded to uh, to make his point. And, you know, uh, we, we admired him and looked up to him from that standpoint, but uh, he, he had his moments. He was difficult. Well, when in your I heard, from your uh, when I when I saw yeah, go ahead. later in life that uh, I kept seeing all this stuff about uh, Iran Contra, and I kept hearing, uh, you know, that Oliver North. And I thought, could that be the same Oliver North? And as soon as I saw it was, I said, oh my goodness, you know, uh, he had no business in the White House. I mean, he should have been out somewhere as a regimental commander or something like that. I mean, he was a Marine. He shouldn't have been. Uh, he shouldn't have been doing anything that involved the civilian world. Well, based on your personal, you know, experience, do you believe that Oliver North was a traitor to the U.S. or a victim or a member of the New World Order? All right. I, I, would you give me those three choices again? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Uh, was he a traitor to the U.S. or a victim or member of the New World Order? Well, given that three choices, uh, I would see him more as a victim. Um, I mean, he, he he did what the president directed him to do. Uh, for a long time, he had his own Air Force, he had his own Army, and he ran around the world at will doing what the president and his advisors told him to do. I mean, I, I certainly don't see that as as him being a traitor. He was a military officer uh, serving in, in the best way that he could, and when his commander-in-chief said, I need you, he said, yes, sir, like any... Uh, serving officer would, but uh, you know he was misplaced. He should not have been uh, chosen for something like that. He he was a military commander and he was very good at, at that. And uh, you know I knew that he would not fit in in the civilian world. So, Daryl, thank you for that. If you become the Constitution Party's POTUS candidate after the whole nomination process, what would be your top platforms well boy that's a tough one i uh i'm uh very disturbed about the uh the abortion videos that we've seen recently that which is held up to the american people right in front of their eyes exactly what it is so i would uh try to do something about that i you know, I would try to, to tell the American people uh, exactly what's been happening and, and what's been happening to them. You know, I would try to eliminate from government as much as possible the, the people who have been appointed by uh, these New World Order presidents over the last uh, few administrations and, and the people that they've appointed that have entrenched themselves, ensconced themselves like like uh, burrowing into wood and so forth uh, so that uh, some different in influence could come. And I would try to move us toward a, uh, uh, a sound currency and a, uh, a free market economy. Those things are all uh, factors that I would consider. I, and, of course, you'd have to look very carefully at uh, foreign policy to see where the existing threats at that time were and so forth. Right now, I, I don't have the... Uh, I don't have access to a daily CIA briefing like the president does, although I understand he he doesn't bother to attend most of the time. But nevertheless, mm -hmm. he's uh, out there, golfing. <laughs> there's certainly information about these threats around the world that uh, that I'm not privy to right now. But those are some of the things that would concern me. Uh, a couple questions. Uh, Common Core. I'm Your thoughts not on Common Core. I mean, I. Uh, to me, it would be a non-entity because I don't believe there's any federal role in education whatsoever. So uh, that would eliminate Common Core and, and its ilk as a possibility. Excellent. Um, and uh, also, as we know, Trump big thing, and you know this is an issue too. We met at the border, uh, legal immigration. Well, Trump's right on immigration. I, I I haven't heard him say anything that I don't agree with. I mean, I I follow that line of reasoning myself. Um, I'm dead set against it. It's illegal and it's it's uh, cultural annihilation, in my view. So something needs to be done about it. Absolutely. And, and you know, go back a little bit because you mentioned the Federal Reserve. So would you end 
I, I, you know, obviously it has to go through Congress. I mean, it's not something you, you can't do executive orders, but would you try to encourage the ending of the Fed? Well, yes. I mean, uh, that is job number one. I, I would tell the the American people what the Federal Reserve is and how it's robbed them for the last 100 years and how one of its uh, missions was to protect the dollar and how it's lost 98% of its value and um, uh, spread unmanageable, unpayable debt around the world. That's if our economy still exists at that time. But uh, right. I would certainly put Congress in a position where if it did not uh, repeal the Federal Reserve Act, it would have a lot of explaining to do the American people. And you have to understand, Shalene, that if I were elected president, it would take a sea change of thinking among the American populace. So they just might support me in, in things like that. Uh, well, I have somebody here live with us. I have their mic live. Somebody you know, uh, somebody I know, somebody I also have a lot of respect for, uh, Mr. Bill Lucenhide. Hi, Bill. How are you? Well, hello, Shalene. Hello, Daryl. And I certainly uh, thank you for taking my call. And I'd love to have the honor to uh, speak to Mr. Daryl Castle. Absolutely. Go ahead, Bill, your question to Daryl or comment. Well, uh, first, uh, Stephen, uh, certainly looking forward to you coming out here, Daryl. Uh, I will have the opportunity to share the stage with Daryl at the Constitution Party meeting we're going to have at Knott's Berry Farm on September the 19th, and I'm certainly looking forward to that, Daryl. And uh, I do have a question for you. And, oh, before that, let me say this. When and you decide to run for president, you'll have my full support and certainly my vote, as I've seen you as a man of character, integrity, and faith in action serving with you on the board of the Constitution Party, and I say that again for all of your audience. This is a, a, a fine uh, gentleman with some backbone and some real vision for America. But with that said, uh, my question is this. Uh, with Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, they're showing um, that there's a lot of distrust of the two parties that are the duopoly that's out there, if you will. And I see parallels between that and 1968, at a time when I know Daryl was thinking about a lot of things. Uh, it was also a time when America was very, very polarized. I, I think we're as polarized now as we were then. We have distrust of the two parties. Uh, we have the emergence of political movements on the left. Uh, in 1968, we had the Peace and Freedom Party on the right. We had the American Independent Party emerging out of the two parties. We had insane war politics uh, and policies in 1968. There was extreme racial divide in America in 1968, like we're seeing today, and uh, that was separating the nation. And so what I wanted to ask Darrell is, uh, do you, what lessons can we learn from 1968 that we might be able to apply to the year 2016? And, and what lessons did we learn from that uh, era that we can apply to now? Well, the lessons are certainly uh, similar, as you said, the times. Those of us who lived through those times, uh, you know, remember how difficult and how scary they were and how, uh, the, you know, out of those seeds that were sown, fruit is coming uh, to bear right now. But um, I see a lot of the problems that we face as economic. A lot of the problems now that we see as racial, of course, uh, have to do with the president and his divisive policies, but a lot of those race, racial problems are economic problems. If we had not offshored our jobs and transferred our manufacturing to other uh, third world countries and, and to China, uh, we wouldn't be having a lot of these problems, and we need to at least start the process of, of reversing some of that. And, uh, you know, I would do that through trying to, to restore a free market economy in America and a sound currency and uh, reversing uh, the trade agreements that we have, the free trade agreements, if you want to call them that. They're really not free, but nevertheless, that was the beginning of offshoring. I mean, that obviously cannot be done in one presidential administration, but it's, uh, it is a, at least a start. Fantastic. Bill, any other further questions or comments? I'll agree with Daryl on that. I've done studies. You realize if we had, historically, the tariff in the United States was about 20%. We're competing against China. There's no minimum wage laws. There's no child labor laws, prison labor, all types of, no EPA. 
uh, no workers' comp, etc. How are we going to compete against such such a thing? I uh, did a study a couple years back. If we had a 20% tariff on uh, imports, which is the historic mm-hmm. level we used to have, do you realize we could make the United States budget for the year 1990? as recently as the year 1990, and uh, be able to fund the entire government, all right? Maybe a a smaller government, 1990 size is what we need. So uh, it's ridiculous what we're doing, giving away our wealth and our resources and our jobs to overseas, and Daryl is absolutely right. We have underemployed youth, uh, uh, underemployed people of all ages, frankly. It's creating uh, uh, an undercurrent of unhappiness and and uh, and so forth and you know there's no saying idle hands makes for the devil's workshop so i agree with daryl on that and shaleen thank you very much for having me on the show and uh it was a pleasure serving with you as well and I'm, i can't wait for the day i can see you again in person well amen and likewise bill thank you so very much and i want to agree with uh with bill there uh about the underemployment that we're seeing in the country but daryl uh, you've studied this for, for years. You've been politically active. Don't you think this has all been done by design? And shouldn't the way, the American people, they need to understand this, that there's people like the Rockefellers and George Soros working behind the scenes. You've got the builders, the CFR. I'd like you to talk about that a little bit. Well, there, there are those who, who accept the conspiratorial view of history and those who think it's just a matter of incompetence, and both are probably right. Um, but uh, uh, it's relatively foolish, as many politicians who mention it openly now, to think that there aren't people out there working for for a one-world government, a one-world religion, a one-world cashless economic system where we're all watched and recorded on camera and everything is digital and every single move that we make is controlled by someone else so that after a while, we come almost like a different species. I mean, that is where we're headed for sure. Uh, and, uh, you know, whether it's by design or by stupidity and incompetence, you know, uh, power corrupts the mind and the morals, as Lord Acton says. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. And we are bestowing on our executives now virtually absolute power. And it's a very frightening uh, scenario. We need to take that back. Uh, the people need to take it back. And uh, you know, I just think if we if we do a few basic things in America, it can be a dynamic country again. At least, you know, I agree with Trump about that. At least. Well, you know, and and what you said is is great. And speaking of Trump and you, you know, what I've been thinking about lately, uh, you know, the New World Order. I mean, they have an agenda. You call them what you want. Only when the elite don't really matter, but the people who are controlling, moving us with the UN towards a one world everything, uh, they uh, don't like people getting in their way. And, you know, you've got uh, JFK, you've got Bobby Kennedy, uh, y- you know, certainly Martin Luther King here and a few others. And we clearly see what they did to Ron Paul back in 2008, especially in 2012. And now we're seeing, because Trump obviously is a bigger personality with quite a bit more money, and we see what the media, the controlled media, is doing to him. So so we need to stop them, but can we? Or are we, I mean, look what they did to Ronald Reagan uh, in the beginning when he wasn't in lockstep with their agenda try to to assassinate him so it's a dangerous it's a it's a dangerous uh you know activity to try to stop them but one of course we would we need to do and your comments on that well it's a dangerous job for sure uh thinking like we do like i do and i as i've said in speeches from time to time uh when i take that oath of office uh, I would exercise it to the best of my ability or die trying. And uh, yeah. if I didn't realize that that is a distinct possibility, I wouldn't be doing this. It's uh, This whole thing is not a game to me. So I realize if, if by some uh, chance the American people uh, wanted a Constitution Party candidate as president, that were me and 
uh, and God lifted me up and, and made me present, you know, I, I'm in his hands. So what, what comes, comes. And, Amen. Uh, it, it's worth, some things are worth fighting for, and that's one of them. Amen. I agree with you. Now, let's say Donald Trump ends up on the ballot. I think they're going to try to stop him, of course, just like they did in the delegate process, just like they did with Ron Paul. But just, just say he does. Would you encourage others to vote for him in order to help stop the New World Order? Because certainly he would have a huge chance of winning. Well, I'm, Our, not, I'm sorry. Go yeah, ahead. go ahead. No, 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 no. No, go ahead. That's really I'm the question. I'm just saying that I'm not uh, completely sold on Mr. Trump. I mean, he's pro-abortion. He's, he, uh, he's pro-free trade agreement. He, uh, he is against many of the things that I'm in favor of and in favor of many of the things that I'm not. He, he certainly is a, uh, a, a different voice and a welcome voice in many areas, and there are many things for me to agree about, but uh, I, when I got in the Constitution Party when it was founded in 1992, uh, I committed myself to it and its ideas. So I would support the person that the party chooses to raise that banner because I believe it's right. Yeah. Well, obviously, besides Donald Trump, and we've mentioned earlier, Bernie Sanders is the, one of the Democrat candidates. And he's not just a Democrat. He's a self-professed socialist. And he's Drawing huge runnel like crowds, uh, mostly youth, seem to be attracted to his campaign. Are we such an, an indoctrinated collectivist society today that liberty is not only not attractive to youth, but it's simply now just history with no comeback? Uh, yes, to answer your question. Uh, uh. That is, if we're not there, we're dangerously close. Uh, I think at least 50% of us are there, and it it makes it very difficult. So and what is the solution to bringing liberty back? Well, the solutions that I have told you, uh, I mean, uh, I was schooled by Howard Phillips early in my political thinking, and it was Howard's opinion that uh, one president could change America fundamentally, just like Barack Obama has in one mm. president term i still believe that's the case and the person who's willing to die on that hill as they say could do a lot of things to reverse much of the damage that's gone on in the last 100 years uh that's a little bit different thing uh, howard phillips was great and we want to make sure to honor him he was a great man a little bit different thinking well maybe it's the same but your former running mate chuck baldwin i remember having a conversation with him once and he said the way to bring back our country wasn't at the federal level but at the local and state levels so do you agree with that assessment uh, to a certain extent i do but uh, i also think that uh, we're virtually out of time uh, we'll be out here uh, nullifying and seceding and so forth when uh, while the uh, the people that run the federal government are completing their fence around us. Uh, so uh, yes and no. Uh, I mean, I do think that uh, there's a lot of things that could be done by governors and state legislatures that had the guts to do them for people who weren't uh, tied into the system and so forth. Uh, I think that uh, if, if, if the states just started ignoring federal regulations and just said, you know, we're not going to apply we're not going to comply with them. And then when the lawsuits were filed and the federal judges uh, handed down their judgments, the states just said, we're not going to comply with those either. I mean, that in the fact is de facto uh, secession. Uh, that mm -hmm. is something that's probably uh, going to start happening at some point, and it's cause for rejoicing. So, you know, I, I see both sides of that issue, but I'm a, I'm a candidate for national office when I decide to do that. And uh, my work is at the federal level, and I certainly believe that we could make tremendous uh, differences in this country if we had a Constitution Party president, whoever that person might be. And we uh, recently we had the Libyan financial expert Jeff Berwick on our show, and he suggested for those in the U.S. who could leave should move to another country now. Do you agree? disagree and why all right he suggested that people uh, could uh, people who can should move to another country 
Well, yes. uh, that is something to that everybody has to consider. I mean, certainly uh, looking at foreign real, uh, real estate and finding a place that you think is somewhat safer and more protective of your assets and that sort of thing is is, is pretty sound advice, I think. I mean, I don't plan to to uh, to move out of America, uh, even though I could if I wanted to. I don't plan to do that. Uh, I'm here for the long haul. This is my fight. It's, these are my people. It's my nation. Uh, you know, a nation uh, can exist in different places. Uh, the nation is us, and where we go, it, it, we're still part of the nation, but the, the state, the country, is different. It has political boundaries, and uh, I'm going to stay here and fight to the last drop of blood. That's the way I see it. I mean, if uh, I'm not saying I wouldn't buy foreign real estate. That's a pretty wise investment, I think. So uh, yes and no. I'm not ready to give up on America yet. Okay, that's good to know. I'm glad you're a little optimistic. Uh, so besides, Daryl, your family, your law firms, your politics, your podcast, which we'll discuss in just a moment, you and your lovely wife, uh, Joan, also founded an organization, Mia's Children. It's about this foundation. Well, Mia's Children is a, an organization that ministers to homeless gypsy children primarily. They're not all gypsies, but most of them are in Bucharest, Romania. And we started it, my wife and I, and, and one Romanian lady uh, in, uh, in 1998 with one little girl. And uh, now we have about 50 children in it, and uh, these people would be starving in the, in the ghettos and the streets and the sewers of Bucharest if it weren't for this mission. So that is what Mia's Children Foundation does. It, it supports these children, uh, feeds them, clothes them, gives them love, and, and it teaches the world and, and Romanian society in particular that uh, gypsies are just like anybody else if they receive proper love, understanding, and teaching about Jesus. Uh, we've resisted many efforts uh, to help us if we would just simply give up our Christian uh, faith, and we have been unwilling to do that. So we struggle on, but uh, that's what it is. How can people get involved? Where, where, what's the uh, website to your foundation? Uh, it's Mia's Children, M-I-A-S, no apostrophe, Mia'sChildren.com. You can go to our website. There's a, site, a place there where you can make donations. Um, and, of course, you can always send them directly to the foundation. But all that information is given on the website. Okay, fantastic. Um, now your podcast. First of all, uh, Daryl, how in the world do you find the time to do all of this? Do you ever sleep? Well, it's it's. Uh, you know, I'll be honest with you, it's it's tough, um, but it's been a labor of love, and I I decided it's been uh, five years now that I've done about 600 of them, and uh, I decided that I would start on behalf of the Constitution Party trying to educate people on on the Constitution and, and on current affairs and applying it and giving my own commentary and so forth, and, uh, you know, it's... it's uh, come to the point that it is now, but uh, I enjoy doing it, and uh, I've reduced it now to to one a week from the three that it used to be because um, I'm traveling and speaking so much, but still, uh, you know, I hope it's beneficial and helpful to people to hear it. I've got a lot of people out there that listen every time, and uh, they always comment. I really appreciate those folks. Oh, absolutely. So it's called the Cat Report. And how can people listen to the podcast? Well, castlereport.us. They can go on there and uh, if they, they can get an RSS feed so that they, it's automatically delivered to them every week. Uh, but they can listen by just going to castlereport.us. Oh, fantastic. So, Randy, uh, what questions do you have for Daryl today? Well, um, Bill kind of stole my thunder, uh, <laughs> some, but, uh, you know, because I had some that were more in the lines with uh, economics, but I do have others. I mean, as, pre you know, as president, you know, there's, you know, so much to do. There, there's so much damage has been done to this country in the last, I don't know, let's say 15 years. Um, you know, if by the grace of God, uh, Daryl, you did get elected, and there's so much change that needs to be done, 
you know, you're just one man with one vote on Capitol Hill and, you know, being a Beltway outsider, how, how do you even start? How do you get anything done? Because you know that you would run into resistance in the Senate and the House and and probably the Supreme Court. I mean, where, where, where would you, you know, where would you start? What's like, you know, the first day there, what's the first thing you well, it's true that I would just be one person, but you have to understand that in order for me to be elected president, there would have to be a sea change of attitude among the American people, and the American people would not elect me, given my platform, if they did not want me to be president. And so uh, I would hope that it would sweep in a, a different thinking in Congress, but, uh, you know, I would just simply do what's right, and I would stand before Congress and the American people and say, look, this is what this organization is, and it's what it's been doing to you for the last 100 years, and, uh, you know, I need your, your help and your support in getting rid of it. Uh, and, uh, you know, we see what happens. Uh, I believe oh, okay. that that is the case. I don't think I would be uh, a one-person president. I mean, unless uh, uh, unless the American people supported me, I would not be elected to begin with. And if they did, I would hope they would support me through those times as well. Right. Well, you know, the, this last midterm was um, basically the American people telling that current guy, hey, you know what, stick it. And as we have seen... You know, nothing changed. You know, it's just more of the status quo, uh, you know, with, you know, how, how they're conducting business. Um, well, well, let's get into some specifics. You know, we had a guest on in the first hour. What would you do about the VA and the, and the what is really an epidemic of uh, homelessness among our veterans? Um, what, what would you do with that? Well, First, uh, I wouldn't create as many wounded veterans as the last couple of administrations has, so there'd be far fewer of them to take care of. But uh, I would certainly uh, make sure that the, uh, the American Republic lived up to the promises that it's made to these people. And uh, as I said earlier, I think they would be uh, far happier with me than they are would be with any Democrat and Republican administration. I, I would hold their lives and their families very dear to my heart, and every decision that I made would would um, would reflect that. Oh, excellent, excellent. Uh, what about what about you know we we talked about uh, well we um, y'all talked about it earlier. What would you um, do with like the, the UN? Would you tell them, you know what, get the hell out of our building. <laughs> get out of New York. Get out of our country. Would you do that? Yes, uh, that is a foundational principle of the Constitution Party. So, yes, I would I would give them uh, three months to get out of town and tell them that they were welcome back any time as tourists, but uh, that organization was not going to be located in the United States anymore. I don't know that their building would ever be usable again. Uh, uh, because it's so infested with uh, with uh, listening devices and so forth, we'd probably have to implode it. But um, certainly, sounds it's, good to me. Uh, a castle administration, yeah, there be no United Nations. I can tell you that. Uh, well, you, you're, you're being kind. I would. I, you're being kind. I would tell them you got 24 hours to clear out, or you're arre you're going to be under arrest. <laughs> so, um, well, what about? Um, I guess this would be like uh, maybe like a ballot measure. What about uh, you know term limits for Congress and, and the Senate? What are your thoughts well, on that? How how could we have term limits now? Uh, and it's called the electoral process, and the Constitution yeah. has to be amended in order to do that. The American people simply have to have the courage and the guts to to elect the right people. So uh, I mean I don't. Uh, personally, uh, that that solution bothers me a lot. I can certainly see its advantages, but uh, I'm not yeah. in favor of it. Oh, okay. It, we're, we're what about to, uh, somebody mentioned a minute ago uh, before I came on talking about uh, the heart uh, changing? I think that was Hillary Clinton actually talking about changing the hearts of people. 
uh, the hearts of people right. are going to have to be changed where they elect the right people. Yeah. Amen. Well, you know, there, there's a lot of people that don't have a lot of faith in the electoral system. I, I think it, it was either Stalin or Lenin said, it doesn't matter who votes, it matters who counts the votes. And sometimes you, you got to wonder about that. Um, what, about, uh, what about lobbyists um, up on Capitol Hill? Well, it's a problem. I mean, people who, who work in Congress every day tell you that you need lobbyists. Uh, you need lobbyists to, to educate congressmen on what they're voting on and things like that. Uh, but there is certainly uh, uh, too much money floating around in, in politics, uh, in the electoral process, and in, in Congress. I mean, why do we think people donate all that money? Why do co uh, corporations donate to political candidates, why do foreign governments donate to political candidates, and then they wash it through the system right. and so forth? Um, you know, that's that is a great problem, but any solution has to be done within the constitutional process. Right, right. I I agree, and it is I mean, a problem. I, I would, I foreign would, money. I would be a president. I'd be a president who was not afraid to tell the American people. You know, Senator Smith over here, folks, uh, it wouldn't, no matter which party he was in, uh, he voted no on my proposal, but uh, you have to understand that this corporation that's going to benefit from it gave him $250,000 last year. What's that mm -hmm. tell you? Exactly. I'd, I'd like to see more of that. Or, you know, foreign governments should not be uh, putting any money into our elections, period. You know, that's, you know, that's, uh, you know, wrong on every level um well well my last one <clears throat> that i've got uh, forgive me if uh, it had been addressed with uh obamacare you know i've seen a lot of the other candidates say first day in office repeal what what, what are your thoughts on that and what would you do well, I'm obviously not in favor of it, and I'd certainly like to see it repealed. I mean, we've destroyed the American medical system. It was working just fine up to about 1971 or so, and the federal government started being involved in it, and it's been downhill ever since. So uh, my uh, policy, my hope, would be to, to withdraw the federal government from uh, control over that industry like many others. Uh, there's no reason at all why the federal government should control health care in America. Right. Amen. Well, okay, I, amen. I've, I've got one more. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I My notes are all over the place. Shalene's neat and orderly with her notes and questions. I've got chicken scratching <laughs> here, and uh, my last my last one kind of goes back to Ying and yang of the show. <laughs> yeah, yes, dear. Yes, dear. <laughs> um, <laughs> putting... What are your thoughts on putting the U.S. dollar back on the gold standard? Well, that's something we have to do. It's part of having a uh, a uh, sound currency. There has to be something sound backing what we do. It can't just be thin air and paper, as someone said. I think it was von Mises, actually, who said uh, only the U.S. government could take a valuable commodity like paper and reduce it to absolute nothing but uh, uh <laughs> yes that is that is something that has to be done and it's going to be done one way or the other uh unless we go to some type of digitized cashless society which is one of the reasons why they're working so hard uh toward that end right now yeah i don't Mark like that. The that that's that's too much yeah. control yeah, neither do I. Uh, Daryl, why do you think, and, and I, I, can't, I certainly can't understand it. You know, when I was, uh, you know, part of the, the Constitution Party, affiliated with it during my campaign, I thought, I'm going to be in a party. This is the best one out there. And yet people don't seem to be jumping ship from the GOP and jumping over to the Constitution Party, why do you think they don't? In fact, I messages all the time. People message me, Shalene, we should start a party. I don't. We don't need to. There's already the Constitution Party. Why do you think that the Constitution Party hasn't grown? Well, it, it gores their oxes. Um, 
there aren't any rich people in the Constitution Party, for one thing, uh, and that denies us media access and it denies us ballot access. We have to fight like uh, cornered rats for every single ballot access we get. I mean, we've had litigation going on in Tennessee, which we won three straight federal lawsuits, but now we're set for trial again in July, in January of 2016. Uh, they keep appealing every uh, victory that we get. Uh, though that is a big problem, but the other side of the coin is that people people uh, vote in their own best interest, and 50 percent of our best interests are tied soundly to the federal government. We're we're approaching 50 percent anyway of our people who who obtain their living from the federal government and and they vote for people who are going to promise them that that uh that dependency will be increased not decreased and here in the constitution party we say you know we we have nothing to offer you we have nothing to pay you except liberty and constitutional government and if you would just give us a chance we could build a more dynamic society where people would be working and not standing in the government's handout line that that up, uh, sales to some people and some people it doesn't. Yeah, it's perplexing to me as people are crying out for not being under tier yet they voting for more. Speaking of ballot access, will if you are the nominee for the Constitution Party, will you be on all 50 states? Or as uh, Obama said, didn't he say 53? <laughs> 51, whatever he said, but would you be on the ballot of all 50 states? Yeah, I it think he, he said 57. He 57 states. And 57, there you go. go. I knew right. it was something uh, that was like, But uh, yeah. the answer to that question is probably no. Uh, let me put it this way. Mm -hmm. Unless we have ballot access in enough states for me to theoretically win, I'm not going to be the nominee, but I I see that developing very positively, and I'm excited about that, but I, I have to have ballot access in enough states to where, uh, theoretically, if I carried every state, I could win the election. I don't want to answer the question, uh, why are you doing this, when I know that I have no no chance of winning because I, I'm not on the ballot in enough states. So the answer to all 50 states, probably not, but enough to win the election, yes. Oh, fantastic. You know what, Daryl? In fact, that just uh, for me, you would be the candidate that I would vote for then if if you if you end up on the ballot. And if not, then I'll have to go with one of the other ch uh, choices. So I think that. that was an honest in, in answer of integrity, and I and I appreciate that very much. But in the meantime, you're out there speaking. So where, where's your next speaking engagement so people can hear you live and ans ask you questions live? Well, in uh, the early part of September, uh, the dates escape me right now, but just before I'm scheduled to speak in, uh, in Los Angeles, uh, and that date is on um, the 19th of September. Uh, the, a couple yes. of days before that, I'm scheduled to be in in Spokane, Washington, and give a speech there. And I'm going to be telling the people the, the same message that I'm giving you, and that is that, uh, you know, we need to stand up and fight for what we believe in and uh, try something different, try something that hasn't been tried in 165 years. So that's what I'm doing. Now, do you have an exploration website right now where people can go to? No, I don't. Uh, as I said, FEC rules are, are, are stringent, and that uh, in the near future, uh, I'm sure I'll be announcing and we'll be forming that website and that committee and so forth, but at this point, I haven't done that. Now, when is the Constitution Party nomination process? Uh, well, the, the convention is in April of 2016, and that will be in Salt Lake City. We have a national committee meeting coming up in Albuquerque in the last weekend of October, uh, which uh, Frank hasn't told me yet, but I, hopefully I'll be speaking there. Uh, but uh, the, the nominating, we nominate by convention, as you know, and that is uh, in April of 2016. Fantastic. Learn more about the Constitution. Uh, Daryl, are you still there? I'm still here. I lost you. Okay, how can people learn more about the Constitution Party? 
Well, just go to constitutionparty.com, and uh, you can download our platform. You can print it out if you want to or read it. It's got the seven principles of the party on there. It's got a link to my podcast and many other things, but that would be a place to start. Fantastic. Daryl, thank you so much for your time today, for being here. You have an open door policy like anybody with the Constitution Party to our We appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you, Shalene. It's always a pleasure. Anytime.